FSC, Fast Jack Speed and Custom Shop Channel. We're going to continue work on my son's 1974 Ford F100, but today for this video, we are going to focus on the brakes. I started a video earlier in a series of us redoing the rear differential. We removed the rear differential, removed the axle shaft, removed the rear brakes. Actually, the rear brake plates are basically just hanging on the end of the axle tubes, and that's where we left it. Afterwards, I started looking at the hydraulic system from the rear on up forward, and I discovered that the rear brake hose is cracked, and the way the previous owner had it zip tied to the frame was chafing against the frame. I don't know why they did that, but not everybody knows what they're doing, apparently. So we started investigating the condition of the brakes from there forward. I took all the front brakes off the truck. Took the rotors off and had them checked and they're too thin. They cannot be turned anymore. So ultimately, we just decided now to just go ahead and replace the entire thing. Why take a chance with any of this old stuff? The condition of the truck prior to my son buying it is pretty much unknown. Everything seemed to function, but after I took some certain things apart, we found out, no, they're not so good. I got a couple of wheel cylinders in the back that were seized up a little bit. They just weren't working properly, if at all. The brake shoes in the back were chewed up a little bit. Like somebody was ripping at them with a hammer or something before I took it apart. The hoses, like I said, the hoses in the back were junk. The hoses in the front were mediocre. I didn't find any cracks in them, but of unknown age. Consider where this truck is going and what's going to be done with it. And to be honest, brakes on these things are pretty cheap. I mean, I got the brake drums for the rear for $35 a piece. I mean, it's not a lot of money to do brakes on these, at least parts-wise. So we decided, F it, we're going to do the whole brake system from the rear all the way to the master cylinder. It's all going to be replaced, with the only exception being the hard lines, provided the hard lines come off okay. So far, they're coming off just fine. So everything hydraulic from the master cylinder all the way back, completely replaced. Since I already did take some of it apart, I'll show you what I did, and then we'll start removing the remainder of the pieces, get the new master cylinder coming, and get it installed. So here we are with the master cylinder. We're going to head and replace that. That leak right there was us. We dribbled it when we took the, took the top off to see how, uh, how the fluid looked, but it was kind of just exercise of futility. Don't mind this wire. We'll just push this out of the way. I just have it draped there. That's the original air conditioning wire. That'll have to be redone and rerouted at a later date. So here we are at the driver's side front of the truck. And here's the other problem we had. Right here, a bracket slides in. This one right here with this little spring retainer clip on the top. I do have new ones of these. It's not like I needed them, but I bought them. I thought the new kit came with this screw. We had to buy that screw separately. But here's what the problem is. This bolt threads into that hole. And if you look at the threads, I'll have to try to hold it steady. You'll see what some complete idiot did. So I'm hoping I could simply replace this bolt and clean this hole out with a tap and get all that garbage out of there. I'm assuming, hopefully... That this cast iron is stronger than whatever material this bolt was made out of. And simply those threads are dirty and the bolt is destroyed. I bought new bolts. I bought new sliders. Now you'll see by the conclusion of this video how this little project turns out. Okay, so now I have my son Sean taking off the tubes to his master cylinder. The trick to this is really simple. When they get old and rusty, those collars, those outside collars that you turn with the wrench... Those things get tight to the tube, so then when you loosen the collar from the master cylinder, the tube bends with it, and then it breaks. But this being an original truck, without a lot of road salt, we don't have that rust problem. So he already took the rear one off, which the rear one, meaning towards the back of the truck, actually works the front brakes. The one he's working on now works the rear brakes. If you could look at the size of the bumps on the master cylinder on the top, the front reservoir is small because that works the rear brakes. It doesn't take much to do those. The rearmost reservoir on a master cylinder works the front brakes, and it's the largest. So since we did pressure wash and clean the truck, I had them put the rag underneath it to catch any drips. To some people watch this video, okay, yippee-yo, you're taking off a master cylinder, big flipping deal. But not everybody's done this. So 
So we'll cover some of the basics. The plan is here, he now decided he wants to change the master cylinder. We already knew that. But he wants me to take off the brake booster, sandblast it, and paint it. Because, well, we've painted almost everything else we've touched. And this is pretty big and an eyesore. Now he has his tubes off. So now all he has to do is break loose the bolts that hold it onto the brake booster. That's rather nuts, the studs on the brake booster. Pop them off and then the master cylinder comes right off the truck and job's done. Okay, so now the master cylinder has been removed. And here we have the brake booster. This unit here, what it does is it takes vacuum from the engine and makes power brake. That white thing on the top, which we're going to remove after we take the whole unit off, is basically just a check valve. And what it does is allows it so if your engine stalls or shut, you shut it off, you have a little bit of power brake left. It makes this unit right here hold vacuum. And vacuum is what it uses to make the power brakes work. Now, as most of you should know, the brakes will work without power brake. You just have to step on them a lot harder. So to take this unit off... It's just simply these bolts in the back here, two here, two back there, and then up under here, the rod, that rod right there with that bolt, that rod right there in the center screen, that's what the brake pedal pushes on. There's your brake pedal and that rod. So I have to take that rod off. This right here is your brake light switch. So when you step on the brake, that switch turns the brake lights on. And that's how it functions. In a strange twist of events here, this truck has a different setup. If Sean will move it up. The brake pedal doesn't push directly on the brake booster like most other trucks have that I've ever taken apart. This truck has some kind of a leverage system to give you more leverage to push on the brake booster. So there's a cotter pin right here. I'll have to angle the camera differently. There's a cotter pin right here we're going to take out and slide that pin. Now, this is a 1974 Ford truck. I've done these complete changeovers on 75 Ford truck. And uh, this is why I often complain about the pre-75 Ford trucks. This body style started in 1973. But from 73 to about late 74, they were kind of using, let's say, older truck parts. Then from 70, late 74, call that 75, till 79 when they discontinued the body style, they basically kept it the same. This truck is just at the very tail end of the early years of the dense side Fords. Hence, I'm finding these very little differences, this being one of them. Okay, so what we decided to do is this bracket, we're going to take that bracket off, sandblast it, and paint it. Since we're in a sandblasting and painting mood, and to be honest, if I have to break out the sandblaster, I may as well sandblast everything because it is a sandy mess. The reason I'm taking this video here is also to show you the difference. If anybody has ever worked with these dent side Fords, the 73 through 9 model year, commonly called dent side because of the decorative dent in the side. The one I took apart, this rod that you see in that bracket, comes from the brake booster and goes directly into the cab. This one's kind of this odd, oddball one. That rod goes to the brake pedal and pushes that lever that we took off with the master, with the brake booster. Well, I just figured I'd show you what the differences are. Ford certainly made enough of. Ford certainly made a lot of different pieces for the same body style of truck over the years. This is one of many. Okay, so I got these new bolts here, which as you see, the threads aren't destroyed. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, these are the bolts that hold the caliper sliders in. And the threads are trashed. I don't even know what or how this was done. So either way, I'm going to use this here tap and I'm going to clean out the holes in the steering knuckle. Okay, so now this is the hole right here that's been boogered out. And the idea is I'm going to try to tap it out and see 
and make sure that I can clean the threads. If they don't clean out, it's got to be drilled out and made bigger with yet, yet another size tap. Um, I don't know whether these bolts are available in bigger. We'll find out. Well, hopefully we won't have to find out. It's feeling pretty good, actually. I may not need the PB Blaster, but if it got tight, I would, I would use it. Yeah. Don't think we need it, but thank you. This bolt doesn't hold any weight. It just simply bolts in and holds the slider from sliding out. That slider is what takes the weight of the caliper and the brakes. This bolt simply keeps something from sliding out of the way. It holds no pressure as to whether the brakes function or not. Okay, so now I'll thread the bolt in and tighten it down. Now it bottoms when it tightens, so we'll see if it pulls the threads with it or whether it stays put. That one's good. Don't have to put a lot of torque in it to kill it. If you really want it to be extra cautious, throw some Loctite on that. But that's enough threads to where I'm not worried about ripping them out. That's cast iron, and that's some other kind of steel alloy, which is softer than the cast iron. So this side, that works fine. The other side is just as boogered. Let's go see how that cleans up. Okay, here we are, same problem, passenger side. Other new bolt. I like that. That's not too tight. That's not too loose. That's not going to just come out driving down the street. Mm -hmm. The collar is slightly damaged, but not slipping, so I can still reuse it. I'm trying to retain the factory lines if I can. Caliper and brake holes. Now we force air into the lines. That'll just catch. We'll just have to have somebody hold it out a little bit better. This is just scrap. a lot nicer. Automotive basics. You break them loose with a pipe, with a tubing wrench. I was almost call it a pipe wrench, really isn't it's a tubing wrench. Because these will round off, ones like this will round the corners of the collars. Once you break them loose, then it's easy. Comes off with no trouble. That's if they break loose. So allow me to talk about my shop and what it does for a minute. Up here in Wisconsin, we have salty roads. If you buy a brand new car and drive it up here every day, like the average commuter, in five to six, seven years, good luck putting a bowling ball in your trunk. It'll fall through. The amount of road salt up here is incredible. It's not just here. It's anywhere where there's a salt belt where it snows. This truck originally is from Oklahoma, purchased in South Carolina. I don't think this thing has ever really seen cold weather, let alone salty roads. Hence, this stuff comes apart. So, how does that pertain to my shop? Well, I don't only work on other people's stuff that they bring me, but I can find you something that you want. Something, say, off the West Coast, something off of down South. Something that actually is old and 
has a body left because it wasn't from the salt belt. And build it to your liking. Exactly how you want it, it's how you get it. In this case, my son bought the truck. And then I started working on it for him. But I could have found this truck and built it to spec for anybody else that wanted a truck like this. And that's the difference. Another one. Okay, so this is the brand new brake rotor that we have for the truck. Obviously, there's two of them because I have enough bearings here, two inners, and two inners, two outers. So just for the picture for the time being, I don't have to film every single thing I do. I'll show you doing one. The rotor's brand new. We did take care of it. We painted the outer edge and the inner edge because eventually this truck's going to get custom wheels, and this is all going to be visible. So we're trying to eliminate the rust. So for right now, we just got to pack the bearings. It's brand new. The rotor comes with brand new races already in them. So the old races that come with these bearings, we're not going to use them. Now, if you're changing your bearings out of an original rotor, you have to replace the races with what came with the new bearings. If you're using a new rotor and new bearings like we are, these are just going to be used for future. I'll put them by my press to push in other similar sizes bearings and races if you're going to be putting like you take your rotor off and you send out the machine shot to be turned you have to make sure that the bearing that came out of the left side goes back in the left side rotor because the, the wear patterns are going to be the way this rotates in that race eventually it makes a wear pattern and all wear patterns are different if you put wear patterns that don't mesh exactly they wear themselves down quick and you make your bearings loose so this is all brand new, doesn't matter. The races that came in the rotor are the races we're going to use. So now we just simply have to pack the bearings. So I'll pack all four. I may not video all four, but I'll pack them, put them in, and then we'll put flip them over, put the inner and the wheel seal, and that'll be that, and then we'll get to putting them in the truck. So there's a couple ways to pack bearings. I've been doing it all my life since I was a child by putting a bunch of it in my hand and gooping it all in there slowly over time. They've made bearing packing tools for quite a long time, and I don't know, I guess I'm a creature of habit. My father always would just have us do it by hand. It was a good practice, and when you're a kid, it's fun. But when you're an adult, and you don't want to get both hands completely greased up and make a huge mess, well, then you just want to use a tool. So I bought this syringe-type bearing packer, and... Uh, works good this is high temp disc brake grease it's just simply exactly what it says it's made to handle the higher temperature caused by disc brakes yeah i know people are like well who runs drum brakes anymore well well you're talking to the guy that daily drives a 64 chevy so <laughs> you tell me who who would use drum brakes And now the grease has been shoved up in, under this ring, holding all these little needle bearings, and out the top. You see where it came out? Kind of like soft serve ice cream. Not this. That's just a slop in the middle. But this right here. As long as that's all the way around, which it is, this bearing is completely packed and ready to go. Mm hmm And then we have properly packed inner and outer wheel bearings. Okay, so now all you do is you take a little, little bit, not a heck of a lot, and you smear it on the inner race, sorry, smear it on the outer race in the rotor. Don't need a lot, just enough to cake the race up a little bit. We're not going to put the bearing in here yet because this one goes in once it gets put on the truck. I figure for now I'll do it since I already got a greasy finger and I'm going to need it. I'm gonna need my greasy fingers soon anyway. Meaning, I gotta grease this side now. More grease, get it on the race on the inside. Let's get it so you don't have any steel showing.
take the bearing, cone side down, put it in there, and you're done with that. Same with the other side. Take your bearing, cone side down, put it in. Take your wheel seal, right here. You take a, if you have a big enough piece of metal or even a block of wood, you can hammer it in that way. Or what I like to do is just work it little by little around until it's flattened. It's not a precision piece like a wheel bearing, uh, it's not a precision piece like a wheel bearing race or anything like that. So if you can pick up the camera and show you how to tap them in. Just put them in like so, give them a little bit of, hold them a little bit. Just tap around a perimeter. Light taps, you don't it's not a, you have to kill them. You know, we're not lumberjacks here. You hear that solid hit? That means it's bottom. I just put a little bit of oil on the surface where the seal rides, right there. And again, since the rotors are brand new, it doesn't matter left from right, they're identical. That's seated all the way. Bearing in. And steal a little bit of grease. Then your washer goes on. Notice that flat tang. The flat tang goes so the washer doesn't turn on the spindle. Grease on your nut. You need a tire and rim with the center cap pushed out to do the adjustment properly. Let's get it reasonably tight. The amount of torque you put on this nut is very little. It's amazing how much weight these things will hold, but very little torque on them. Since all we're doing is adjusting the bearing preload, we don't have the caliper on there, we don't need it. All we gotta do is just put the tire on, zip two lug nuts down, it gives me more mechanical leverage to feel the play or lack thereof. Turn the wheel a little bit just to get the grease to get out all into, the, into those needles like you saw. And you grab the top and bottom. This is easy because it's got good tread. You can get your fingers in it and wobble it up to down, up to down. Now there's no way to audibly hear it. There's no way to see it. But you feel just a little bit of up and down wobble. What that is is it's just a tight, a touch loose. So you just give it a little bit more tighten to it. Spin it a little, stop, and a wobble. If you're doing this, of course, this only works if your front end is tight. If you got bad kink pins or bad ball joints, you can tighten this until it breaks. You're never going to not feel the play of a bad ball joint. This only works on a tight front end. Keep that in mind when you're working. Just a little bit. Now, it just went away. Might just be a touch of it, which is fine. So now what you do is you take this piece here, this little castle washer, for lack of a better term, and you place it over the nut. What it does is, is it basically gives you multiple positions to get the cotter pin through the spindle. It's covering the hole right now. Take it off, go one click over, and now fish for the hole again. Obviously, the cotter pin just went through the hole. Just double check it. Take the cotter pin, roll it over. Cut them a little short, but enough where you can still get a wrench on there to take it off. 
attach the end. Or just let it fly across your shop. Your choice. It's your shop. Press in. Tap it flat against the spindle. Take your other end. I usually cut it about there. And just give it a little push in. Some people got different methods to do cotter pins. All that does is keep that nut from backing off. There's no craziness involved. Previous owner put silicone, RTV silicone, on there. I don't see a need for that. I'm pushing the dust cap. Honestly, that is a little loose. Probably why I put the silicone. If anything, I just rounded the edge out a little bit. Do a little push in. And that's it. You don't have to bash it so hard with a hammer that you bend it in. If you do, if you have to really hit it, get a screwdriver and push that lip down a little bit. Shove it in that way. Don't hit here, otherwise there's no room for the cotter pin in that nut. There you have properly adjusted preload. Okay, so now we're on the driver's side of the Ford. We're going to go ahead and install the brake pads and the caliper. And then right after that, install the hose. The so first thing we want to do is we want to put a little bit of grease, don't need a lot, but just a little, on the sliders. The caliper only squeezes on one side of the rotor, but it squeezes like a C-clamp. So as the pads wear out, the caliper has to transition in well, it starts out and it has to slowly transition in. That's why you want these lubricated a little bit. Not a lot. You're not trying to make a huge dirt and grease trap. But you are trying to enable it to slide a little bit. And on these, it's mostly down here. In this piece, in that piece there. And up top. The top is just not really important because that doesn't really rub there. Just get a little bit of grease on that. And that's all you need. There's only one more part you might want to put some grease on which is the bottom of the caliper, but we'll mess with that in a moment. Okay, so now I'll show you the reason why we have these anti-rattle clips. Directly in, without it, as you hit bumps in the road, that rattles and really drives you insane. So you put these little clips on the brake pad like such. That's just a little spring-loaded little deal. It stops the rattling. It's just that little spring-loaded clip right there. Gives a little upward pressure on the pad. and stops it from rattling when the caliper isn't squeezing it. Then you take your other shoe. Put it in the caliper. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of grease. Not a lot, just a little bit. Don't need to have a lot. I'm going to put a little bit of grease on this bottom mating surface. Because this is where... The slider rubs. We're going to hammer in a piece of metal that goes in here in that cavity. So let me set this down while I'm making a mess. I'm also trying not to scratch the paint too badly. We didn't paint this, but it came painted. So there's a, there was about a wear and tear accepted or expected. I'm trying to add to it caliper goes up in like so at this kind of an angle up and then down now you see where I put the grease in there You 
center it with that hole right there. Remember that hole from earlier? So once we tighten this down, give it a little bit of torque to it. Not crazy. We're not trying to rip the threads out. That bolt doesn't even touch this. It just bottoms into the hole. All that bolt does is keeps that piece from sliding back and forth. No more, no less. Now the caliper can wear in as this pad wears out. The caliper will slide in nice and gracefully. Oh, and back again to what's left and what's right. The brake bleeder always goes to the top. So now we're putting on the brake hoses. So the way it works is the whole fluid comes through the hose and out into this block. The hose then enters this, the, hole, the fluid then enters this hole in the shank of the banjo bolt and squirts out the middle of the bolt. So to seal it from escaping out from the head of the bolt and the block, you put one of these brass washers in. And it goes in its cell. That way the fluid goes in like you saw. Then you put another one another brass washer on the inside that way it makes a good seal now we attach this to the caliper it goes in over here on this side I don't know if my ratchet can grab that Gotta get it reasonably tight. Don't gotta absolutely kill it or murder it, but definitely gotta put some force on it. That only goes in one direction. That way they know from the designers from Ford when they put this together, that way there's no way this hose can kink by accident unless you really got stupid with it and twisted it and turned it in a way it ain't supposed to be. And that clip goes in there. clip in. Let me put this in here and very carefully thread this on. That's it. Next, next part is bleeding it, which we'll do once we get the master cylinder installed.